This is The Extra Mile. Hey everyone, welcome back to The Extra Mile. I'm Caleb Spear along with G5. The G5. Going to get right into our topic um, this morning. Racial tensions, they have never been higher in this country since, really, the civil rights movement of the 1960s. And, of course, Christians cannot be silent about these matters, nor can Christians be hypocritical about them. But no matter what, we have to be a light. Yeah, exactly. And more importantly, we should be reasonable, we should be willing to listen, and even change Mm -hmm. if we see change. We, As Christians, we should know that change starts in the heart. Uh, When we look at churches... A lot of ways, churches reflect our nation, and we closed out our last episode um, about the riots. You could say it was spurred on by this deep-rooted nationalism yeah. by contrasting that with reasonableness, and we closed with this passage in Philippians 4, 5. Yeah, and Christians are told there to let your reasonableness be yeah. known to everyone, which means Christians, we can't always just be on the attack, always talking. We can't always be defensive if we don't like something, but we have to be willing to admit fault, and at the very least, to be reasonable, we have to be willing to just listen. Yeah, and we're reminded that in James one nineteen, It mm-hmm. says, be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. When we're angry, what we do, we shut off our ears. Uh, we don't <laughs> like to be lectured to. We don't like to be told that we're wrong. Being lectured to can spark some real anger, but listening should be more than just hearing someone talk. It should be mm-hmm. reflecting on ourselves and our own actions and showing empathy to those who may feel hurt. That's it. Yeah, that's exactly it. So, We're going to have a conversation with two fellow preachers of the gospel who are also men of color, and they're going to share some wise, they're going to share some godly things with us when it comes to Christians being both reasonable and willing to listen when it comes to racial justice. I hope you enjoy. All right. Hey, guys, thanks for coming on in the Extra Mile today. Um, we got here in the top left corner on your screen, we got Alexander Newman. Newman, give us a little run back, rundown on yourself. Hi, I am Alexander Newman. I am currently preaching in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Uh, I graduated from FC, uh, Florida College, back in 2015. And, uh, you know, I'm very excited to be on this podcast. I try to have a pretty big hand in how we handle these racial conversations over the past couple of months and and as my time as a preacher but ultimately the gospel is what's most important so i hope that's what we're going to be focusing on today and realizing that the only way we can find peace and hope and justice is in christ nice and then down there in the bottom in like a full-blown green screen studio and all down there we got roy mason roy give us a little uh, background on yourself Hey, everybody. Name is Roy Mason. Um, I am a biblical studies major at uh, Florida College, um, and I'm, I'm finishing out my last semester. I've been preaching um, in this area for about uh, three and a half years. So I, I'm really excited to, to be here, go way back with Alexander and, and Caleb. And um, I, I just really value conversations like these. I think it's good for Christians um, or like-minded people, even different uh, people of different minds to just be able to sit down and, and have uh, discussions like this. So I'm really excited to be here too. We're excited, we're excited to have you guys. It's good. I'm looking forward to our conversation and uh, I think it'll be good. It'll be good for people to hear this too. We're going to go through a series of questions and uh, we're going to have you guys answer it. We really want to keep this light and conversational. Um, And also, more importantly, biblical, because it's all about glorifying him and understanding that we are to love him and uh, our neighbors as well. And so our first question for you guys, is there a racial problem in the church? You want to take it or you want me to? Uh, Seniority. (laughs) Um, (laughs) This is a I mean, this is a question like people naturally have been asking over the past couple of months. It's hard for me to say with the paint with the broad brush that the church has a racial problem. I think that when you look through it's like statistics, protect, particularly in COCs around the nation, that they're majority white. Um, so they kind of get raised with that mentality. Um, but it's very hard for me to look at the church and be like, OK, they may there may be struggles, particularly with like saying ignorant things. But to say that we the whole church is racist. 
I don't think that's true. Um, growing up in, in a congregation my entire life, the church is the place I felt like my race mattered the least. And I think that's, that's super important because no one ever treated me any differently because of my race. It was when I was acting like an idiot that I got in trouble and stuff like that. Um, so it wasn't until I either went to school or, or whatever that it became a bigger deal. So naturally, I think when it comes to how we raise our children and some, uh, I don't know, there, there's plenty of examples of racial, bad racial tensions that happen in the church. But overall, I just don't have that view. No, that's uplifting. That's how it should be. Yeah, that's pretty positive. Yeah, it is. Roy, you think you have any issues you have or have experience? Well, I, I guess for the most part, I would agree with Alexander that I wouldn't generalize the entire church and saying that, that, that there's a huge like problem of just racism being everywhere. Um, but I, I do think there are right. race problems or um, racial issues in, in terms of like, for example, I come from a military family, moved several different times. I've moved six or seven times in, in my life. So in every state that we'd go to, we'd worship at a different congregation. But um, for majority of it, right, majority of my life, I worship at congregations that were majority black. And it wasn't until one of the final moves that we made, uh, the Colorado, that I went to a congregation that was majority white. And it's almost like two different, like entirely different social bubbles. There are people and Christians and uh, communities that I had no idea like existed until worshiping at a, at a majority white congregation. And, and you could say that and vice versa and talking to some people, um, they experience the same thing. I actually still have conversations with people where they'll say, hey, there's a, a congregation in the area that is a, a church of Christ, but it's majority black and they have no ties or, to it, have never had a conversation there. They don't even know, like they couldn't say if they knew it was a, a faithful congregation or not, just because they haven't been there. And so I think there's still that divide in terms of, I think the church could look more diverse, um, but I, I don't I wouldn't outright just say everybody's a racist, but yeah. <laughs> sure. So everyone's agreeing on the board. It's not like obviously today, especially people are outrightly saying we don't right. want people of color in the church like <laughs> you'd be hard pressed to find that person maybe you found them last week in the riot but not in not in the church overall probably not going to find those people um i guess what do you believe are the factors at play i guess specifically this is back on you roy um because you just talked about how you had black churches white churches I and mean, what do you believe are some of the factors at play that creates sometimes a racial divide amongst own brethren um, I don't know. A lot of times I, I talk to uh, people about being the, the change that they they want to they want to see. And a lot, I think everybody would fight for diversity within the church. I think if you went to a majority black congregation, they'd mm -hmm. say, of course, we want more races or other races here. Or if you went to a majority white congregation, of course, we want more or other races here. But I think um, maybe there's a cultural pressure in terms of um People say that, but I think that would take a, a lot to do. Like, it, it'd be weird to be in a congregation where you're the, like, if it's majority black, we're the only white person there or, or vice versa. And mm -hmm. so I, I think it just takes um, a lot of, and I think that takes a lot more time and effort than people may understand or realize. But um, there's probably a lot of people uh, stepping out of their comfort zones um, and, uh, and and being the first to take that step and also having people who are ready to support them in, uh, in, doing, in doing that or doing such a thing. Um, I just think that uh, everybody's behind that idea, but I think there might be more to it than people first realize. So, mm -hmm. Now, Newman, you said you felt like it wasn't that way at your congregation growing up, um, where you said you felt like race mattered. Am I quoting you correctly? That race mattered the least when you were at church. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's, so that's the way I... Did you ever... Was. But that, that's great. Like that's the way church should be. But did you starting with Newman? Did you ever, whether it was at the private Christian school you were at, or it was at some sort of Christian function, or specifically that church, did you ever have a moment where you did feel like by other Christians you were treated differently or unchristlike because of your race? Well, yeah. I mean, there, there's plenty of examples I've heard of with, with other people. Um, just in general, I think that there is kind of this almost generational thing where there's stuff that happened way back in, in you know you can look at preachers rhetoric pre preachers rhetoric back in the 20th century and you can clearly see that they did not have the right view of how christ should uh use race and how we should be handling it and then that gets passed down to their kids and then they pass that on down to their kids if they're not teaching them something different they're letting them live in ignorance so once you get to this point where you know we have a huge hurdle to 
jump when it comes to that. But the way that people treated me, I know it's not inherently just them. I know that's years of people mm -hmm. treating, mistreating them with their rhetoric towards people who look like me. Um, but particularly, it's a lot of comments when it comes to being just dumb. Um, there was uh, oftentimes my freshman year being a very, like, very much the minority outside of being like the basketball team. It's me and like another guy my freshman year. And it seemed like everyone was berating me. If you wanted to make a racial comment that was supposed to be hilarious and funny, it was coming at me. Um, and that is really hurtful. Uh, you know, you really do feel like an outsider in that, in that type of situation. So again, while I do understand that there, it's not entirely their fault that they've also been raised in ignorance, but it also, it, it does cause a lot of pain. And I think we have to take a real good look at ourselves and how we talk to one another, how we reason to one another, because even when you're a kid, the way, or I mean, a college student, the way you treat one person in that situation that has a big effect for how it goes later. So in the church, it's been good, but I think we have to be aware of how we're teaching our children. And that that's where it affected me the most was with particularly the kids. Hmm. And then Roy, you want to answer that question? Yeah, I actually agree a lot with Alexander. Um, and I think it touches, especially on the idea of um, sometimes it's, it's the subtle things and how much they build up because I, I experienced that same thing too, in terms of the kind of jokes that people would make. Um, and you know, jokes are jokes and people make them, you understand that. But when, when it's so repetitive and you're like, this is something I'm now starting to hear like every day, or like so many people feel like they have to make this kind of joke to me or, or say this kind of thing to me, um, you start to feel some, some kind of way about it. Um, and so, you know, like we were just saying, it, it may be hard to, um, uh, you know, it would be pretty hard to find someone who's just in the church who's just today, who's just outright racist. But on the other hand, there may be some, some, maybe some social things that we can, um, inform each other on uh, a little bit better or help each other to understand. Um, I, I guess those of us who know that can, can tell that to other people. But I, I think Alexander will also admit that um, being on the receiving end of that, it's also our responsibility to, to let people know like, Hey, um, it's kind of like the fifth time I've heard that today, or, Hey, that makes me feel this kind of way. What would, uh, what would an ideal future be for a more biblical church when it comes to things like race and that we're talking about, um, what would you, what would you like to see in the church? What does a reasonable relationship look like? We'll give it to seniority again. <laughs> uh, I mean, I'm sure there, there's plenty of things that Roy and I can go back and forth on. I think having conversations like these is the first step. Um, I think when we have our opinions and then we go on the internet and we find more opinions that line up with our own, or you go on the internet and you find someone who's black and their opinion lines up with your own about how you should think about this. And then you use that as a, almost as a weapon against someone else's experience or against their uh, personal beliefs or something like that. That's really destructive. So what happens is we use the internet and we use uh, almost like other people of our race against one another as a weapon, rather than let me sit down with you. Let me understand where you've been. Let me understand your experience. And let's talk about this uh, naturally from a scriptural point of view. Um, because when you mix in the world with how you interact with one another, it's always going to be destructive. Um, so when you're able to come together, reason together, look through scripture and see how does God handle this issue? How does Jesus handle this issue? And how are we supposed to learn from this? You're never going to end up with the solution. You should be racist. We should segregate our churches. It will never be that way. So I think that's, that's the first step. So it's almost... It's almost like the internet's creating this wall between us and, and trying to have empathy with, with others. Yeah, uh, I absolutely think that. I mean, uh, just simple cyberbullying, that's how that's worked out. But you're able to say a lot right. of things on the internet that, you know, it just, it's nothing. So. But you just want to say in person. Yeah. Roy, what, what do you think? Um, I think the, the ideal way that would look was kind of like what I was talking about in the future is, um, gawking into a congregation and diversity not being hey there's a couple of like hispanic people here a couple of black people here but it truly is like mixed that's something that my mom always looked for said she wanted is like a true just mixture of of people um and kind of like alexander was saying i think that does happen with discussion people being one that willing to sit down and, and have these kind of um talks but uh i guess definitely people starting to get out of their their comfort zone um 
I think that's an idea that that we that that's preached in the gospel a lot is this idea of not not that there's anything wrong with being comfortable, but um, it, it can get dangerous when you, things become too comfortable and just being ready and being uh, willing willing to step out of your comfort zone to to make sure um, make sure some some good is happening. And so, you know, who better to make a congregation diverse than you being the one to go to a, a place that might be culturally different from yours, just to, to say, I, I'm going to make an effort to reach out uh, in this sense. I like those. I like those. Sorry, Kayla, to step out for a second. How would, uh, how would someone be comfortable, do you think, though? I mean, there's a lot of people that, that don't feel comfortable making, having these conversations. Um, well, I, I think... I think this is this is one of the way, you know, and I, I think it's ironic that we we're just talking about how the Internet can be used as kind of a weapon in some senses. But definitely um, it can it can be used as a tool as well, like the conversation we're having now. But um, there are a lot of YouTube channels that I like to watch that are real social ones that that um, gather their viewing off of this, off of people uh, of opposing views or people of uh, different views or whatever, sitting down and, and having a conversation. Um, and so there's a lot that you can, you can learn from that. And, and I think uh, that's definitely one way is that if someone is uncomfortable, they can look in a conversation that they don't feel comfortable putting themselves in yet, but see someone else doing. And I think the internet like is really good for that, that or just, um, uh, having support, having a, a group. I remember when I was, uh, I lived in St. Louis and I was worshiping in Ferguson and a group of, of white girls from down the street came to our congregation. And obviously they stuck out, but I think the fact that they were there together made them more comfortable uh, being there. Um, and so I, definitely taking people and having friends and people with you, I think it's going to make them more comfortable in that situation. Uh, it's really good. Um, All right. Well, when it comes to, you, uh, to scripture here. What do you guys have in mind when we can just start this idea of being reasonable and listening to one another and seeking out to, to bear one another's burdens? What scriptures came to your mind um, that's going to have a Christ-like point of view on not only race in the world, but race as brothers and sisters? My default one that I, I love and appreciate a lot is Acts 10 with Paul and, and or Peter and Cornelius. I think that one has a tremendous impact on like, this is an apostle and he has a kind of bigoted view of the Gentiles at this point. And God walks, works through Cornelius and, and, you know, through his sovereignty is able to, you know, bring him to an understanding of what the gospel is for. It's for the Jew and the Gentile. I love that mm -hmm. passage a lot, but I think particularly when it comes to reconciliation and how we speak to one another, uh, having that reason, first Corinthians 12 is, really important to me i think um <clears throat> so over in first corinthians 12 towards the end of this passage he talks about how the body is composed of many members that there are some people who have different qualities and different traits that are helpful and beneficial to the body and it's not our place to say i can cut you off and i'm going to work just as well and it's not for us to also say i'm so insignificant that i'm not worth anything because god has given uh, dignity to every part of the body. We just work differently or we work for different uh, tasks and stuff like that. So I think that's just an important thing about the body overall and how we handle that. But the conclusion that Paul starts making, uh, starting in verse 25, that there be no division in the body, but that the members have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. So when there are hard things that go on uh, this summer, like, for instance, this summer, when it was George Floyd in that incident, if the first reaction was these riots are horrible, condemning the entire, you know, BLM movement, whatever, I think that's a wrong position to take. I think that if you have a black brother and sister on your Facebook or in your congregation, you go and you talk to them, you're like, how are you feeling right now? How can I care for you in this moment? Because everything, it went straight to politics instead of how can I care for the body? And I think that when you have that care for each other, that not only is it when things are bad, but also when things are good, knowing what your brother's going through, that's something that's helpful and beneficial, uplifting them. Um, only Jesus can give us this joy. Only Jesus can bring us this true reconciliation. And it starts by letting his spirit change us into what we're supposed to be in the body. I think that's really important. Great thoughts there. Excellent thoughts. Roy, did you have other passages like that? Yeah, exactly like that. I think it comes pretty pretty similar to what 
uh, Alexander is just saying, um, uh, mm-hmm. Stan in Acts, uh, my first thought to, to speaking with reason and being reasonable um, comes from Acts 17. Uh, and it hits on it a lot uh, in verse 2 and verse 17, even later later in the next chapter, in verse 18. But it talks about how uh, Paul made a custom of going to people, or the Jews specifically, and, and reasoning with them, speaking with reason. It says in uh, chapter 17, mm-hmm. verse 2, and Paul uh, went in, as was his custom, and on on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the, for Christ, for the Christ to suffer and rise up from the dead. And so it says the same thing uh, later on in verse 17. But the idea is kind of like what Newman was saying. Um, and I can see how things could easily get out of hand, especially uh, in topics of racial issues, um, especially when you have movements and people who are making really, really radical claims or really controversial things and other people will uh, support those movements or support those people while not necessarily even um, supporting or, or subscribing to everything that they say or do, how things can be easily misunderstood and um, taken the wrong way. And so I guess what we were talking about using the internet as a weapon or just how we're coming across, you don't want to bash people over the head with your your comments and or, or um, just be really forceful or tear people apart. But um, staying of that peaceful mindset and coming across peacefully and, um, using reason in your in your words i think will will uh go a, a long way and you know i think that's the first thing that um we see that even jesus does in a lot of situations in his time where he's hurting the most after the death of john the baptist he he still shows compassion on other people so even in hard times responding to people with compassion because i think that's going to be the first thing that they notice and, and remember right in a time where they're hurting or having a hard time um that people went out of their way to show compassion to them even when they were also having a hard time or when they were they didn't necessarily understand everything. So mm. George is going to read James three chapter three, verses 17 and 18 right now. And what that says when it comes to being reasonable, it says, but the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace yeah i looked up in the in the in the greek english lexicon that word for reasonableness it says not insisting on every right of letter or law or custom yielding gentle kind courteous or tolerant so the people or christians with a reputation of being reasonable are known for not you know shoving their opinion in everyone's face they're known for being yielding they're known for being kind they're known for being courteous they're known for being tolerant so that's like the biblical, obviously, point of view in hearing out these tough topics. Why do you guys think that naturally many conservative Christians have a real aggressive defensive position when it comes to issues such as race? Um, well, I guess we'll start with seniority again. Oh, no, no, we're going to start with Roy. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, Roy. Like we were saying before, I think uh, people uh, think it's pretty – you know, it's pretty obvious that most of the congregation is filled with just outright racists. And a lot of people, I don't know if I'd say pride themselves on that, but they will definitely say, I am I am not a racist. And so they don't take kindly to being um, pointed at uh, or, or, or accused of being one in, in, in any way. Um, and so I, I think that's why people get defensive. And also, I, I think that there has been a little bit of a, a, a pattern of people being uh, told that they have to feel bad or need to feel bad about some of the stuff going on. There's some people who are like, listen, I'm not a racist. I'm not doing these things out to the street. My grandparents and like my, my ancestors didn't have slaves and, and things like that. So why are you putting this pressure on me to, to feel bad? And I think that's why people um, come across defensively at, at first. Um, but uh, one thing that I've been, I've, I've been kind of pulling from all this is that it, even in that situation, being a racist or not being a racist or whatever, it should just be the standard. There's still this expectation of us as Christians, kind of like how you were just reading about the, the peace and the gentleness and the tolerance that, that, are, um, that are attributed to Christians. Um, that's something that should be expected of us, right? So it goes farther than just the things that we don't do, but the actions that we do take, right? And so while I'm not a racist, I still am caring about other races and other people. And that's something that people can see in my life. That's something that's very evident. So I hope that answers that question. At least acknowledging it, uh, yeah. understanding the issue that it is an issue. Mm. Yeah. Newman, do you have thoughts on that? 
Yeah, I, I mean, I totally agree with that. The idea that people, it's, it's not even necessarily an accusation. It's just like, you know, be aware of what's going on in the world. And you, you take that defensively almost as if you're saying that you're condemning them. It's like, you know, honestly, if I'm bringing something up like this to you, it's just because I want to know that you care. And that's one thing that uh, mm. I've thought about recently when it comes to how we handle like the Black Lives Matter movement uh, versus the All Lives Matter movement. Uh, when someone says that Black Lives Matter, you know, you don't have to associate with the movement for that statement to be true. So when you are dismissive of it, mm -hmm. of it and you say All Lives Matter, it makes me think that you don't care about possibly things that I struggle and things that I go through. Um, so with the same heart that Jesus has, this heart of compassion, I can look at what's going on in the world and what how other people treat one another. I can look at how uh, some black people's rhetoric, how it offends, how it would offend my white brothers. And I stand against that as well. And all I'm asking is for someone to do the same for me when it comes to this other rhetoric. Um, and that's, again, that's a part of being a part of this body. And, you know, I guess there's just so many things to get defensive about um, for the Black Lives Matter movement type thing. There's a lot of things that are unbiblical about the way that they go about it. And I'm not going to deny that at all. But I think it's important that we do acknowledge that we can separate ourselves from movement and this, these, <laughs> these few words can still be true. And uh, I think that if we mm. teach that, if we live that, there's nothing else that really matters in there. So. Um, I like what you said yeah. there. Um, kind of like what I was saying before is, is that I think this, the subtle things do make a difference. And, and like George was just saying, like acknowledging stuff, I think is a, is a, huge, is a huge thing. Touching on what Numa was saying, that if I have an issue or a problem that's encompassed in, in the racial issues that are going on, and you're not acknowledging, or it seems like you're not acknowledging it at all. That that's you, like just saying that my problems or the things that I'm willing, dealing with don't exist. Um, but at the same time, again, it's the subtle things. I think a lot of people um, who are in that situation uh, really appreciate those who are willing to ask, right? So we're talking about people who are uncomfortable before and things like that to say, hey, I don't, I'm not sure what's going on. I don't understand what's going on, or I'm not doing anything. But is there something I could be doing? Or how do you feel about this? Or, or you know, what what are you going through? I, I think that goes a long way, and I think that's a really simple and subtle thing to do. Um, but that can that can mean so much to people. And, and, and again, is, is acknowledging uh, what may a person may be dealing with. So. so correct me if I'm wrong here. I want to make sure we're clear, communicating clearly. We're saying, um, of course, no one individually, you know, in the churches wants um, want to be racist or view themselves as racist, obviously. But we are saying that perhaps in some points we have put our own opinions and politics over the things that the bible clearly teaches or what jesus would be or do am i understanding this right we get comfortable in our ignorance mm. hmm. george is going to read james 1 8 and 9 this is bounces off exactly what you guys just uh said it says but if you fulfill the royal law as expressed in the scriptures you shall love your neighbor as yourself you are doing well but if you show prejudice, you are com you're committing sin and are convicted by the law as violators. Mm. So that's the principle. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that's the principle from verses one through four. Yeah. Mm. And then down in James 1, 13, it says, For judgment is merciless for the one who has shown no mercy, but mercy triumphs over judgment. And, of course, human judgment is flawed. You guys have been emphasizing that. Sometimes we have blind spots. Um, but if we're going to be like Christ, obviously, as we started, we're going to be reasonable enough to hear people out, especially brothers and sisters in Christ. Why, why are we going to shove them off um, to the side? And that goes really well in with James 3, which also says, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. So mercy mm. should be really, I mean, God is merciful and we should follow in suit with that. Um, yeah, it doesn't feel very merciful if it's like, I'm trying to speak for your experiences saying, no, it's not that way. Instead of, as James 1, you know, 19, Claire says, hey, be slow to speak. Let's be swift. Let's be quick to hear. Let's listen first. I mean, I mean that is crucial. All right, we're going to wrap it up here. Um, I guess we'll kind of give you a, a closing statements moment. I mean, what do we want um, people in Christ Church um, to be? What can we actively do to make sure people feel heard and loved um, on, from a biblical point of view? Number one is 
always preach the gospel. That's what's most important. That mm. the the way to unite both black and white people and people of all sorts of colors all over the world is that we're broken sinners. And that's unfortunate news. But the good news is that Christ died for all of us so that we can all be reconciled to the Father. Um, and that's that's the most important thing. So if we're emphasizing the gospel, we can't we won't make these racial discriminations unless we're taking from our personal point of view. Uh, listening to one another, again, having these conversations, uh, not dismissing one another, really important in that. Um, and just teaching those who are younger that this is how we treat these uh, conversations. Here's how the Bible teaches them, um, because you know we're only going to be here for so long. And what outlasts uh, a lot of what we do is our legacy and what we teach other people. So if we are teaching them that it's okay to mistreat people of other races, that's what that's going to be taught and that's what's going to be lived in future generations. So it's important for us to emphasize that God loves them. And we're supposed to express that same love to them um, and just being con compassionate, loving people. So. Mm. That's good. Um, I, I totally agree. I'm looking at issues like this and, and recognizing that it isn't a political issue or cultural issue, but like a, a sin problem at the heart and core of it. And so not looking to other places to find the solution or find the way to fix it, but I ultimately looking to Jesus and looking to God um, to solve that, doing what we can. And then also, uh, you know, going earnestly in prayer to God to, to pray that he does what uh, he can. Um, at the same time, uh, communication and, and listening to each other, I think is also uh, very important. Um, one of my, my favorite teachers or like my best teachers from high school was just a really great teacher. He said the way that he, he became that great teacher is simply through asking. He just asks his students how he can become a better teacher. And so I think that can help us in just about any role that we feel, whether it be uh, being a better servant or being a better uh, brother or sister to someone is, is asking them. And not only when times are bad, but when times are good, because that's probably the time that we're going to be most unaware. It's like, I'm not sure if I'm doing anything wrong. I don't know if I'm doing anything wrong, but let me ask you, am I doing something wrong? Um, do you, is that something that you receive from me? Do you feel as if um, I'm showing compassion or care to you as my brother uh, and sister? So um, definitely going out of our way to, to make sure that that, that is known um, to, to people inside and outside of the church and just being willing to hear them and ask them and, and just reach out to them, whether um, it's uh, uncomfortable or not. Mm. These are basic things that really help, you know, just build a relationship too. I mean, that is key. Um, and Jesus did that. And we see that the solution to many of these problems is, you know, the true gospel and, right. and delivering that, that gospel. Um, it means being kind being you know trying to be christ-like um and gentle and reasonable <laughs> all i mean all of that that we have to we have to be aware of yeah absolutely well roy and alexander thank you all for taking the time to talk about a tough topic but a much needed one if we just ignore these things it'll create more problems we have to be able to talk with our brothers and sisters and it sounds like as you guys just capped off and george has capped off too the solution is to really view other people as Jesus would view them as fellow sinners, but also as fellow image bearers of God. God shows no partiality. All right. Thank you all for talking with us. All right. Thank you guys. Thank you guys. Thanks yeah, for having thank us. You all. See ya. Hey everyone, thank you guys for tuning in and listening to our conversation with Roy and Newman. I hope you guys enjoyed. There is more content, extended content, right, Caleb? There is a whole lot more, like at least another hour of conversation. So if you're interested in that, uh, we'll put the link in the description if you're watching on YouTube. If you're listening on a podcast uh, platform, go ahead. You can find us on YouTube. The Extra Mile now has its own YouTube page. Thank you all for listening. Thanks. Bye.